Hey there, art nerds. As we enter into October, I wanted to do a little bit of an inking crash course with you guys. So I have a lot of inking tutorials here on the channel that go into everything that we're going to cover today in more depth. And I'll have those linked down in the description below for you guys in case you're curious. But I just wanted to give you guys kind of an overview of several common inking tools and inking methods that you guys might want to utilize when you are inking your own comics and illustrations. So to start, I'm going to introduce you guys to our materials that we're working with today. So we have here a cellulose-based cold press watercolor paper. This is a paper that has a slight texture and depending on what you're inking with, this can really add a lot to your inked art. It can add some texture, it can add some grit, it can add some personality to it. And there is another bonus to that. You can watercolor on top of your inked art once you've inked it. Over here, we have smooth Bristol paper. So this has a very smooth texture and it works well with technical pens and with dip pens. And the plus side to this, depending on what ink you're using, you can use alcohol markers on top of it after. So why might you want to ink your art? Inking can add a lot of dimension, it can add a lot of contrast, and it also provides the line art. So if you're a comic artist or if you're interested in comics, you guys might notice that a lot of comics have kind of that dark black or dark gray layer and then they have the colors as well. That kind of helps tie things together. It can add a lot of contrast and it can add a lot of dimension to your work. I'll be sure to include some examples for you guys. Now, in my comic work, I mostly work with watercolor and I like to keep things very light and sort of picture book esque, but I also do a lot of inked art as well, both so that I can share my line arts over on my Patreon and also because I just really enjoy inking. So I'm going to show you guys the materials we're going to be talking about today and then I'm going to show you guys some examples of inked artwork and then we're going to actually put what we've talked about into practice on our cellulose watercolor paper and our Bristol paper. Today we are going to practice inking with a fixed width pen. So we have a fine liner here. This is a Sakura Micron. So basically the kind of pins that have this sort of metal cap here and then have a small felt tip at the top would fall into the technical or the fine liner sort of pins. We're also going to be talking about brush pins. So I have a Sakura Pigma FB and as you guys can maybe see it has a very fine brush on it. We're also going to talk about inking with a brush. And for that, I have a Winsor & Newton Series 7 brush to demonstrate. And we're going to talk about inking with dip pins and dip pin nibs. And while we have a variety of dip pins and dip pin nibs that we can use, as well as a variety of other inking materials that I'm not gonna be able to cover in today's crash course, this one is a G-nib. And as you guys can see, it has a spring welded onto the back. So this creates a cage that allows our dip pin nib to hold more ink. And that's actually a special add-on. We're going to be inking with the inks that come in our Pigma FB and our Micron. And I'm also going to be using Dr. PH Martin's Black Star Waterproof India ink today. Now, something that's really important to keep in mind is whatever media you want to use with your inks is gonna dictate what kind of ink you use or vice versa. So for example, India ink is not always waterproof. You wanna make sure you find an ink that is waterproof. And not all inks are alcohol marker proof. In fact, the only liquid ink that I've really found that is safe for use with alcohol markers is the Kaime Soul K ink. And I'll link that for you guys down in the description, although we're not going to be utilizing that today. As I mentioned earlier, you have a world of options when it comes to linking or to inking. And I can't mention or show you guys all of your options today, but I do have a lot of tutorials here on the channel, as well as on my old blog, natosoup.blogspot.com, that should hopefully give you guys some inspiration if you don't already have something in mind. There are a plethora of brush pins on the market, and they're not just for brush calligraphers, they're for inkers as well. There are a variety of fine liners on the market. There's a variety of dip pins and dip pin nibs on the market. 
and you can use a variety of brushes to get different effects plus you can ink digitally if you want to or you can use a variety of other types of pens like glass nib pens or you can use folded pens. You really do have a fountain pens. You have a lot of options and we're really just covering, we're just skimming the surface today. To begin, you guys might've noticed the really faint Halloween cat printout on these papers. That's called blue lines. And originally this was designed so that if you were to photocopy it, it would only pick up the heavy contrasty black ink rather than the blue lines. This is still a technique that's really useful because you can emulate that in Photoshop. And if there's interest, I'll do a tutorial where I demonstrate how to do that. It's actually pretty easy if you have Photoshop. And if you have one of the other popular graphics programs like Clip Studio Paint or Procreate and you know how to drop those blues, let me know down in the comments below because I would love to collate these resources for other artists and illustrators. I mentioned there are a variety of dip pin nibs. Here are just a few. I have reviewed and done inking demos with all of these. So if you're interested in dip pen nibs and you wanna know more about them, make sure you check the description down below. In my normal, regular comic work, I don't really do a lot of inking per se, but that doesn't mean I don't ink a lot of comics. Pretty much all of my other comic work is inked in some way. So these are four Coma comic panels and they were inked with a combination of microns. So that's those fine liners and that did the borders and that's gonna give us a fixed line weight and brush pins, which are going to give us this kind of bouncy, more variable line weight. And this is just what I'm comfortable with. It's what I can ink quickly with and it's something that I like. So that's what I use for these. These little micro mini comics, let me fold them for you, were inked pretty much just with our brush pins. These were inked with non-waterproof brush pins, so if you sweat or if you get water on these, they are going to run, but they would have been alcohol marker safe. And then this one over here, same thing. So you guys can kind of see what inking has to offer and inked art can stand on its own. It doesn't have to be reliant on color unless you want it to be. Recently, I put together a coloring book from illustrations from my inked art challenge, Lilliputian Living, which is like a yearly October inking challenge. It used to run under a different name, but we're calling it Lilliputian Living. This is my sixth year doing Lilliputian Living. And I actually have another video coming up where I talk to you guys about my inked October art challenge art supplies and what I use from year to year. This is from a few years ago. But as you guys can see, the focus is on standalone inked line art. And this was compiled into Curious Little Things, my upcoming coloring book, which I will grab for you guys in a minute. But here are some of the additional line arts that were created for Curious Little Things. So these were inked with brush pins, I think with the Sakura Pigment FB, which I'm gonna show you guys today. And as you guys can see, they could stand alone as just black and white illustrations if I wanted them to. These are all inked on watercolor paper though, so I do plan on stretching and painting these. And then this little cute berry witch here, this was inked onto um, a watercolor block and I'm going to watercolor her. So the black is just gonna add some contrast and it's also going to add a line art that I can actually see when I'm painting. And then here is a proof copy of Curious Little Things. And I'm so excited about this. I can't wait to let you guys know when it's available to purchase. You'll have, just have to keep an eye on the community page in the shorts because I'm sure I'll talk about it there. But as you guys can see, these are all the cleaned up illustrations from Lilliputian Living, resized, but they're still black and white and they're still very line work and spot black and dry brush reliant. And I actually have tutorials where I talk about spot blacks. So that's where we fill in larger areas with black ink, as well as tutorials where I talk about dry brush, where since the brush can't keep up with the ink, or rather since the ink flow can't keep up with the movements of the brush, we get this really nice crunchy sort of textural element that can be really useful in say, rendering hair, 
or rendering more textured sort of things. It can add a lot of visual interest to your art. So we're not gonna necessarily talk about dry brush and spot blacks today, since this is a crash course and I wanna get you guys inking as quickly as possible and help you guys find the materials that you'll enjoy. But I did wanna show you guys that and introduce you to the concept so that you know where to look for it on the channel. And then here are some examples of inked art that also include color so that you, so ink can stand on its own or it can be part of the whole regarding comics and illustration. So this is a watercolor illustration that was inked with black ink and you guys can see kind of the contrast that the black adds to it. This was a uh, watercolor illustration inked with colored inks in some areas and that had a much lighter feel. And then we have a couple of alcohol marker illustrations that were inked with colored brush pen. Well, this one was inked with the Tombow Furinosuke colored brush pen, so it has a much lighter area and more colorful feel because it doesn't have all that black adding all that additional contrast. And then we have this Cactus Girl, which was inked with Sakura Micron, so those fine liners in the same sort of um, complementary color line art rather than using black line art. And it's much lighter feeling and much more colorful. So there's a lot of options when you're inking and when you're introducing line art to your art. And I think it really adds a lot of fun. And I think it's just a fun thing to kind of think about. It's yet another tool in your arsenal for you to create the kind of art that you want to be able to create. And then this illustration was inked using a dip pin and an acrylic ink, and then I used watercolor on top of it. So when it comes to ink and inking, you have a world of options to explore, and hopefully that gets you guys really fired up because you can really customize and curate this to suit your art style and the kind of art you wanna make. Hopefully I've got you guys all fired up to start your inking journey. So I want to start really simple. We're going to start with the fine liner. Now these are available in a variety of sizes. You can get them really small. You can get them fairly thick and chunky. You can also get the calligraphy ones, which are just kind of like a wide chisel. And those could be really useful for doing borders. In fact, when I'm inking borders on a comic page, that's usually what I'll grab. But for today, we're gonna keep it super simple and we're just going to use a Pigma Micron in 05, so a really common size. So one of the reasons I grabbed this is it is both alcohol marker safe and waterproof, so it's a good all-rounder. And you can find these almost everywhere. I have seen the set sold at Walmart. I've seen them sold at Michaels. I've also seen them at fine art stores. So these are really ubiquitous. And it's one of the first things as people are starting to get into like fine art art supplies or comic supplies, this is one of the first things that's accessible to people. So I figured it would be a good one to grab today. It's the one that a lot of people are really comfortable with. Then we're gonna move on to slightly more challenging and really it just requires some practice and getting used to the brush pen. You have a lot of options when it comes to brush pens. I grabbed my Pigma because it's, as you can see from the cushy grip that I added on, it's one of my favorites. I use these all the time. This is also made by Sakura. This is the FB or fine brush. It's available in three sizes, a fine brush, a medium brush, and a big brush. And this is just one of my favorite, simple, easy, quick to grab brush pens. One of the reasons I like it so much is it is also alcohol marker safe and waterproof. And the Pigma ink that Sakura uses is a good indication that it's probably going to be fine for use with both watercolor and alcohol markers. Typically pigment based inks when they're fully dry end up being waterproof and I reviewed a bunch of pigment based uh, fountain pen inks a while back shared that here on the channel and also on once upon a time which was a fountain pen blog I had with a friend where we would review different fountain pen inks and their qualities those can be used with dip pens as well if you're looking for various colors that can add a lot of fun to your art you're not just stuck with black ink uh, you can use those with your brush or with your dip pen. So if you want to use a brush pen and you want colorful ink, Tombow makes the Tombow Furunosuke brush pens. They're available in about 15 colors and they have a flexible nylon nib so you can get those thin lines and those thicker lines. 
and that is also alcohol marker safe and waterproof. I'm not pulling that out today though because honestly, they don't put down as thick lines as the FB, and I really wanna demonstrate the flexibility that brush pins have to offer. Once we finish with those, we're gonna move on over to the dip pin. As I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of options when it comes to nibs and when it comes to inks, but I'm gonna keep it pretty simple today. I'm gonna use one of my favorites, the caged, so that's the spring here, G nib. And I got this off of Paper and Ink Arts, but you can find dip pin nibs on Amazon, on Blick, on certain other sites that sell Japanese stationery, one of them I'm still feuding with, so I'm not gonna mention them by name. But they are, while they're not as easy to find, you're basically gonna have a few different brands and Tachikawa is one of my favorite brands when it comes to G-nibs like this. And then finally, we're gonna talk about inking with a brush, what it takes to ink with a brush, what to look for in a good brush for inking. It's not gonna be the same brush that you use with your watercolors because that can degrade your brush over time. And this is more this is more hard mode. Some people really like inking with a brush, but it does take practice and a steady hand and a good brush. So it's not a good fit for everyone. And it's definitely not a good fit if you have to travel a lot or if you have shaky hands or if you just, are more persnickety about your art and you can't be as wabi-sabi and flexible with your art. So we will end after hopefully warming up with the most challenging of the inking utensils. So the first thing I'm going to do is I am going to pencil these illustrations. I could ink directly on the blue lines, but I wanna pencil it because it's gonna show up on camera a lot better. And for that, I would recommend using a harder lead, I would say, HB or harder. If you use softer, greasier B sort of leads, those can sometimes mess with the ink a little bit. The ink doesn't necessarily cure to the paper as well. And it can be more difficult to remove all the graphite from your paper. So when I am inking, regardless of what I'm inking with, a good eraser is really helpful. In my personal opinion, white vinyl erasers are really what you want because they're gentle enough that they're not going to disturb the ink that you've put on the paper and cause it to gray or ghost out. Some people really love gum erasers. I find that they leave a sticky residue, so I'm not super into gum erasers personally, but that might be another good option. Those are those kneaded, soft, very kind of cushy erasers. They're fun to play with, but um, I find that they just leave a sticky residue on my hands. Or the other type of gum erasers, uh, they're like a tan color. I don't really use them as often. They're often sold as art erasers. I find them to be very, very dusty though, and they leave a lot of dust on the paper that I can't always remove. Something else that's handy to have when you're inking that you might not think about is a drafting brush. And I swear by these, if you've watched my stuff here on the channel, you see me use these a lot. These are very helpful for removing any kind of dust that might be on your paper surface or for removing eraser residue, which is really important to do because you want that nice clean surface. One more really helpful tool, in my opinion, you can't live without it, is probably the cheapest. It is a blotter sheet. You can use just a sheet of copy paper for this. It's something for your hand to rest on so that you're not getting the oils from your hand onto the paper and so that you're not smearing the graphite. And it will also absorb some of the ink, which is important when any, any material that you use that puts down a lot of ink at one time. I honestly can't think of any that don't at the top of my head. It keeps it from like, getting onto your hand and then kind of printing all over the paper or smearing. So a blotter sheet is really helpful for inking. We're gonna start off by penciling all the illustrations on the page. Not only will it make it easier for you guys to see, but it's going to make it easier for me to see. I'm working with a harder lead here. I'm working with an HB because softer leads like bees tend to smear a lot when you're erasing and can sometimes cause problems with the inks themselves. So when you're penciling a collaboration with another artist, this is a chance for you to really add in your personality. When you're penciling your own work, this is a chance to improve and push your work. So you can see 
see this as yet another refinement stage to really clean things up. As you become more confident in your inking, you can start with a really, really rough sketch and add in the details when you pencil it and then really add in more details as you ink. So we're starting with our Bristol and it is so smooth. It can be kind of skittish and a bit more challenging depending on how you sketch, but be patient with yourself. With the cold press that you guys see me sketching on here, it has more texture, which can help with control or be even more challenging to sketch on depending on the amount of texture. You can ink on cotton rag as well. I'm using a cellulose because it's more affordable. I recommend that you try not to dig your pencil into the paper because it can cut the paper and make the graphite more difficult to remove and cause bleeding and spidering later on. Now that we have our blue lines penciled, let's start inking. And I wanna start inking with the two easiest, require the least amount of prep or additional material supplies that we're gonna talk about today. I'm gonna to start with the fine liner and then I'm going to move on to the brush pen. And then we'll move on to our more complicated inking supplies that do require some additional supplies for you to be able to use these. So um, with these tests, I am going to start with Bristol and then replicate it on the watercolor paper and I'm going to do that just throughout this whole process. Starting with the Micron on our smooth Bristol paper and smooth Bristol paper is really well suited to fixed width pens like tech pens and fine liners like our Micron here. These kind of fine liners come in a variety of sizes and a variety of colors. So feel free to experiment to find the ones that you like the best. I happen to like the Sakura Microns because they're easy to find pretty much anywhere. They come in a variety of colors and they're really affordable. So they kind of hit all those sweet spots for me. Fixed line width is great for buildings and other static solid things, but I feel like it's kind of boring, depending on your art style, for more organic things. You may have to go over the same lines over and over again to build up a dynamic line weight, which is very time consuming. They're very cheap and easy to find. They're pretty easy to control and you can find them in a variety of sizes, colors, and types. In my opinion, these ink easier on smooth and coated papers like our Bristol than on textured papers like our cellulose. These can be good for like plain air watercolor sketches because they're portable, easy to use, easy to find, and dry fast. So these are kind of like a great starter Pokemon. They're easy to work with. You can kind of train yourself and figure out what you like about your inks and what you want to improve on your inks, and then start to add more inking supplies to your arsenal as you become comfortable with these kind of fixed width pens. They're a smidge more challenging to ink on cold press watercolor paper, but basically anything with a tooth or a texture is going to be just a little bit more challenging if you're not used to it. This is definitely one of those practice makes perfect. And the more you use something, the more comfortable and confident you'll be in it. And this is one of the easiest least amount of fuss inking supplies we're gonna talk about today. We're kind of working in ascending order, going from easy to more difficult. So you can definitely get your practice in and make some really cute art that you can paint or marker on top of using fine liners. There is absolutely nothing wrong with fine liners if you enjoy using them and I mean, I find them a little bit harder on my hands. You can get those cushy grips on them. So that could be a way if you have a lot of inking to do, like you're inking a comic or something like that, that might be a good way to kind of prevent some of that repetitive hand fatigue. The inks also dry relatively fast. So you run far less risk of smearing your inks, particularly on texture papers like our cold press. Here we have my favorite, the brush pin. So brush pins offer variable line weight. The lighter you ink with, the lighter the line weight and the heavier you bear down, the thicker the stroke. You can find brush pins in a variety of sizes with a variety of different types of brushes. So this is really one of those areas where you should experiment and play around with different things 
to figure out just what you like. I've kind of settled on the Sakura Pigma FB and the Tombow Furenosuke because they're just kind of good all-rounders that can do what I want them to do. The Sakura comes in three different sizes. You can get the MB, which is a medium brush, and the BB, which is a bolder brush, which can be really good for fills. And this just kind of works really well for the sort of art that I make. You want a brush that has some give, elastic like nylon, foam, or nylon bristles, over a compressed fiber brush will last longer and they'll be able to take more abuse. And by that, I literally just mean you bearing down on the paper to get those thicker line weights. They used to be more challenging to find, but they're becoming much more common. Most are not going to be waterproof, so you want to look for pigment ink like Tombow, Zebra, Pentel, Sakura, all offer pigment-based brush pens. And I recommend testing them with water and markers before committing it to a piece you plan on markering or watercoloring. I find that I ink faster with a brush pen. I spend less time going over areas, and it's easier on my arthritis since lighter line weights require me to lighten up on the pressure. The smooth bristle, which was so much easier for fine liners, is a little bit more challenging with the brush pen since the brush kind of wants to skitter and skate on the paper texture. Now, since I do most of my inking on watercolor paper, I am really used to that tooth to give me a little bit more control. These are going to take a little bit longer, but not a lot longer than the fine liners to dry. So here on our cold pressed paper, we have a bit more texture. You can get cold pressed papers with a variety of texture amounts. If you want to still work on watercolor paper and you don't like the, the texture, you can work on a hot press. I have a whole bunch of tutorials and overviews where I talk about watercolor papers. So if you're interested in that, even if not for watercolor, but for other types of art. I hope you guys will check them out. This is where I feel like I have the most control. This is the best combination for me. Our cold press watercolor paper and a brush bin. This is my comfort zone. And this is where I feel like I can really start to flex and really start to push the brush pin to give us those chunkier, nice line weights that imply some shadow and some depth and some weight to them. Like I mentioned a few times, I have other tutorials that really focus in on inking with different types of materials. So if you find something that you like and you wanna learn more about it, or you want some tips and tricks on how to use those materials, make sure you check the description down below. If you're one of my patrons on Patreon, I will have this printable blue line template available for you in case you wanna practice inking along with me. We're about to move on to the more complicated part of inking. So we're gonna talk about inking with a dip pen and inking with a brush, and you are going to need some additional materials for this. So I realized my Black Star has run out. It's dried in the bottle, makes sense. It's been a couple years since I've been able to use it. So instead, I'm going to sub out FW acrylic ink. So this is going to be waterproof when dry, but not alcohol marker proof because the solvent in alcohol markers actually will reactivate the acrylic ink and cause smearing. So I just want to let you guys know that. Another thing we have here are dinky dips. And these are primarily sold to calligraphers, but I, as an inker, love them. Let me move my sheets of paper out of the way so we can make a little bit of a mess. So what this does is it holds a small amount of ink so it's not going to dry out. It's not going to spoil as quickly. You're not wasting the whole bottle. I also use these for my masking fluid in a different kind of holder. This is a suction cup holder from Oblique Love Letters. This is a wooden holder that I got from Paper and Ink Arts. And basically, it prevents you from wasting ink, from spilling ink, from ink spoiling. It's great. I highly recommend. I have no affiliation with either company whatsoever, but they are a game changer when it comes to inking, especially inking with a brush or a nib. Okay, so I have filled my dinky dip up. I'm going to screw the cap on. You can get more of these little bottles. They're actually really helpful because as you can see, it can hold quite a few and you can get even bigger ones. This is a small one because I don't really use 
that many colors of ink at one time. So I'll set that aside. You're also going to want a container to hold your water. Now I recommend something low, close to the tabletop. Usually I use a ramekin that I only use for inking, but I have no idea where that is since, as I mentioned earlier, we've moved a few times. So instead I'm going to use a little yogurt pot. I really recommend you don't use something that you would ever drink from because any artist who has drunk their watercolor water can attest that that stuff is nasty and toxic. Something like this is going to be a lot harder to tip over, which is great if you have cats. I mean, shoot, even a children's open sippy bowl or whatever, you know, the kind that sucks into your tabletop could possibly be a good option for that. So something else you're going to want is a scrap of paper and a paper towel to kind of practice on. We're starting with our dip pen nib and I have a lot of tutorials about inking with a dip pen and since this is meant to be a crash course I'm not going to go too far into it but I am using a nib with a cage on it so it's going to trap that ink so I'm not going to have to dip as often which is great when you've gotten into the flow of things. For your scrap of paper I would recommend something like cardstock, Bristol, this is some of the Canton XL watercolor paper and basically what you do if you are working with a brand new nib there's going to be oil on it to prevent rust you can wipe that off with rubbing alcohol some people will use fire to burn it off you can do either I'm gonna dip it just to kinda it's kinda like with a watercolor brush where it's it's just going to work better and absorb better if you dip it in your water so I'm gonna dip it and you see how it holds so there are a variety of dip pin nibs. I like really springy flexible ones that can give you really fine lines and really nice thick lines. The nice thing about the cage nib too is that it will keep up the ink flow so we're not going to get railroading. But there are nibs out there intended for lettering and calligraphy and fixed line weights and I talk about that a lot here on the channel. So we're just kind of warming up the nib and we're kind of warming up our hand. And as we ink, every time we dip, we're gonna just kind of doodle on the paper a little bit. That's going to kind of remove the excess ink from our nib. And it's going to mean we don't get ink splots on our illustration. Now, once you've made a mark on the paper, really you want to kind of try to let it dry a little bit before you go into it because this is actually somewhat sharp and it can cut your paper, which will cause further problems. It'll cause like spidering and it will cause feathering and it'll just kind of chew up your paper. You also want to wait until your ink is fully dry before you make any corrections. Now when we're done, we're going to dip it in our water and you can also clean it out with rubbing alcohol or pin cleaner. You can also use Windex and products similar to Windex to clean your nibs as well. You want to, don't worry about removing every speck of ink, but you do want to remove a good amount of the ink so it's not clogging up your nib. While I've got you, let's talk about brush inking, which is harder and I'm definitely out of practice with this. So this is a size 2 Winsor & Newton Series 7 watercolor brush. Generally what I was taught is you want to ink with Kalinske Sable which is one of the nicest natural fibers you can have. And not to use your inking brushes for watercolor and vice versa because they just kind of tear each other up. So usually with my inking brushes once they get chewed up they become watercolor brushes. So it should pull when you wet it a really nice point like we have here. Of course, I don't want to focus. There we go. And we've dipped it into water, so let's dip it into our ink. We're going to remove a little bit of the excess and then still using our scratch sheet of paper, we're just going to warm up drawing a few lines. You may want to work much smaller than size 2. Size 2 is actually kind of big. You can roll it to get that nice fine point. 
and get some really fine lines and see this is watercolor paper so we're starting to see some dry brush if we move a little slower though we can get steadier fuller lines a brush can also be great for filling in those larger areas. Now I know some of you guys are already commenting about using water brushes and Pentel pocket brushes for inking. And you absolutely, totally can, nothing wrong with that. I just wanted to focus on some of the more commonly known materials for this crash course. So let me move this out of the way. When you're done, clean it out. Try not to get it past the metal ferrule because the wood will soak up the water and break the lacquer. And then when you're done done, you wanna clean it out with brush soap and maybe use a little bit of conditioner, like hair conditioner, just to kind of recondition the bristles and to form them into the shape you want them to be. And you wanna let it dry fully before you put it away. And I keep it in one of these, which it was sold in, because that helps protect it when it's not in use. So let's practice inking with a dip pen and with a brush. So now we've progressed to slightly more challenging inking supplies and we're starting with our dip pen and nib. Now this is another area where there's a lot of customizability. I mentioned that you have a variety of nibs that you can use and I have reviews where I kind of demonstrate them for you guys, but you can get different kinds of holders as well. This is a Tachikawa holder for mangaka. So it's got kind of a rubberized grip and it's a little bit more comfortable to hold in the hand. It can also hold a variety variety of nib sizes from tiny little crow quills to much larger G nibs. I will have links to everything I'm talking about in the description for you guys in case you're curious. So dip pin nibs are very directional. They can sputter if you pull them in the wrong direction. So you basically want the rounded part to be facing away from you. They may also sputter on more heavily textured paper. So they're not the best on our cotton rags. They're the slowest to dry because it leaves a deposit of ink on the paper surface and that takes a while to dry because it kind of forms a skin on the surface and it has to kind of evaporate throughout. And this is particularly true on more non-absorbent papers like our Bristol. So patience is really important. With larger illustrations, I recommend inking a section then moving on to the opposite side of the page or significantly far away so it doesn't smear while the first section dries. Some inks do dry faster than others. Acrylics tend to take a while to dry because they form a skin first. And you want to kind to clean out your nib in your cup of water if you're taking a break or if you're stepping away or when you're done for the session and I find it helpful to spritz it with rubbing alcohol when I'm done to help clean it. So please note a cage nib like the one I'm using today holds a lot of ink. If you're working with a regular nib, you're going to have to dip much more frequently. Don't let the ink dry in the nib. While it can sometimes be cleaned out, it often can't be fully cleaned out and you can ruin good nibs that way. I used to love tank style nibs, which have a big reservoir for ink, but those are really bad for holding on to ink particles and just becoming non-functional very quickly. If you need to take a break, rinse your nib out in clean water and pat it off on a paper towel. You want to make sure that these don't rust. So you want to keep them in a storage container that seals pretty tightly. You may want to throw some silica packets in there, particularly if you're like me and you live in a humid area. So it's a little bit more challenging to ink with the dip pin nib on cold press watercolor paper. Fortunately, this is a cellulose. So that texture is really just embossed in the paper surface. If we were dealing with real paper fibers, that kind of crisscross all over each other, we would have far more problems and this would be much more difficult. And I would just recommend using a brush for that instead. Using a nib can be challenging. It does take a lot of getting used to, but I find it to be really fun. So when I'm cleaning off my nib, I'm really just dipping the nib part in my water, removing the excess water, and then I'm gonna dry it off on a paper towel. Then I'm gonna spritz it with some rubbing alcohol to remove some of the excess ink that's still on it. If you wanna clean it fully, you can soak it in rubbing alcohol and use an ultrasonic cleaner to kind of vibrate those particles off.
So for a lot of artists, brush is hard mode. It is both challenging to find a good brush for inking. If you don't want to use natural hair fibers, there can be ethical concerns with that as well, because a lot of the synthetics just don't do as well as natural hair fibers do. They are very expensive, so there's a cost issue there. Even if you invest the money and you buy a nice one, you might get sent a kind of garbagey one if you're mail ordering them, so you wanna try to buy them in person. You want them to come to a really nice point with a nice round belly when you've wetted them because that's going to hold the ink for you. You also do not want the bristles to splay out. So it's really important to clean your brush in between uses and to make sure the ink doesn't get all up in the ferrule and dry that way because it's going to push the bristles out. That said, there's something very satisfying about inking with a brush. Not so much on our smooth bristle where there's just not a lot of tooth so you don't have a lot of control because it just kind of skates on the paper the same way the brush pin does. Um, but on more textured paper, inking with a brush is a delight because you start to get some of the personality that makes inking with a brush so special. Now, when you're inking with a brush, you're going to want to work with generally smaller brushes, zero, one, and two. I got sent a four in a Inktober art snacks one time. And that was very, you, I had to ink big things, like really big things with that because it just couldn't get small enough with my hand control. But if you have a lot of hand control, you can use those larger brushes to ink smaller things because theoretically your brush is going to be able to come to a really small fine point. So when you're cleaning your brush, you do not want to dip it in water deeper than the top of the metal ferrule. You don't want water soaking in and getting absorbed by the wood because that's going to ruin it. And you also want to clean and condition your brush from time to time. I have a workshop. I transcribed a workshop by Mark Schultz from when I was at SCAD. I was his assistant for that workshop. So I have the inking notes for that. If you're curious to learn more about inking with a brush from someone who's made a career out of inking dinosaurs with a brush. So I'll try to dig that up for you guys and link it down in the description below. So on more more assertive papers, papers with more tooth and texture. That's where I really feel like a brush shines and it really starts to show its personality and it makes you realize why you might want to use a brush. So it has the tendency to dry brush, which can add a lot of grit and texture, personality, hand of the artist, all those Bob Ross sort of words. And it's a lot easier to control on a textured paper. And the textured paper can also absorb the ink a little bit better than a coated paper like our Bristol. So finding the right inking tool and inking paper match for you is really important. And the only way you can really do that is by experimenting and figuring out what you like and what works for you. But I've had a lot of fun inking these eight pieces. I actually never really got tired of inking our little Halloween cat. And I hope you didn't get tired of watching me do it. Hopefully this will provide some really helpful one-to-one -one comparisons so you can see what works and what doesn't work for you when it comes to inking. Today I demonstrated four different inking materials, fine liners, brush pins, dip pins, and brushes on two different paper types, a smooth bristle and then a cold press cellulose watercolor paper that has a little bit of tooth. Hopefully this was helpful and inspiring you in deciding whether or not you want to give inking a try and what materials you'd like to try inking with. I've got a lot more tutorials here on the channel if you are interested in inking and you can always reach out to me for help and advice over on my art centric discord server the paint box. I'll have a link for you guys down in the description below. So of our eight inked Halloween cats. Which one is your favorite? Let me know which one you like best 
and why you like it down in the comments below because analyzing what you like about the different supplies and the different papers will help you decide how you want to approach inking and what you want to take from this to apply to your own art. Very generally though, on smooth Bristol, Fine liners produce a smooth, consistent line. They're pretty easy to use and they're a great option for beginners. They are a bit time consuming because if you do want heavier line weights to imply shadow or to imply weight, you are gonna have to go over that area again. Fine liners are fairly inexpensive and you can find them almost anywhere. So they're a great option if you're just getting started with inking or if you want a dependable and reliable inking supply that's easy to use and doesn't require a lot of muss and fuss. Using a brush pin on Smooth Bristol offers some variable line weight. Like the fine liner, brush pins can be available in with an ink that is both alcohol marker and waterproof, but you really have to check and do your research before you commit to using a material on top of them. They're a little bit harder to find, but they are getting a lot easier to find, and I find them to be very quick and satisfying to ink with. They're great on these smooth papers because there is no resistance. Inking with a dip pin requires additional materials. It requires some additional practice. And I would recommend it if you're already familiar with fine liners and brush pins, or if you're interested in calligraphy because there's a lot of crossover between the two. It's kind of the OG inking option along with inking with a brush. And while the supplies used to be more commonplace, they are getting a little bit harder to find. But if you go to a calligraphy or a stationery store, or even a Michaels, you should be able to find some options. I'm also going to link some of my favorite recommended nibs down in the description below. If you do not have the spring cage welded onto your nib, you are gonna have to dip into your ink a lot more frequently, but if you do have a cage nib, like what I demonstrated here today, you can do a lot of inking without having to dip into your ink. And these allow for a lot of customizability when it comes to what inks you can use because basically, if it's liquidy enough to dip into it, you can probably use it with your dip pen so long as it's not corrosive. I've even seen people using alcohol inks with parallel pins, which are very similar to these for very interesting effects. They do require some maintenance and some upkeep, but they can be a lot of fun to use. But they don't necessarily work well for travel situations if you're inking on the go. They do ink particularly well on heavier, smooth finish papers like the Bristol here. Finally, brush requires a lot of hand control and it may be more challenging if you have arthritis or you have other hand issues, shaky hand, that sort of thing. It's also better suited to larger illustrations than what we have here. A lot of what makes brush really cool was kind of lost on this example. However, if you want really dynamic, bouncy line weights or you want to be able to fill larger areas, brush can be a great option. I personally don't like brush on these smoother finished papers. I feel like that's just not its best use. So moving on to our textured, slightly toothy, a little bit more absorbent paper, let's talk about our four materials again. So our fine liners, in my opinion, are kind of wasted on this paper. They just don't do as well as they do on the smoother paper, and it just takes a lot longer to ink anything. So in my opinion, I would not recommend fine liners on a toothy paper like this. They're just not well suited to one another. I do, however, really, really, really like brush pin on toothier papers like this because it's a little bit more absorbent, it can take a little bit more of the ink, and it's a little bit quicker to ink on because this toothy texture does offer a little additional control for your brush pin. Now, this might be entirely biased on my part because I do the majority of my work on cold press watercolor paper and only a little bit of my marker illustration on the smooth paper. So familiarity often 
can can lead to a bias so take what i say with some grains of salt and keep in mind that i am heavily encouraging you to experiment and try it out on your own to see what you like but i really like brush pins on watercolor paper or on textured paper i think it's a lot of fun the dip pin is a little bit more difficult to control given the paper texture it kind of wants to catch on the nib However, the more absorbent paper allows some of the ink to be absorbed by the paper so it can dry a little bit more quickly than on the smooth finish Bristol. And then the brush is a delight on this kind of paper because there's just enough feedback from the paper to kind of slow you down and give you some of that additional control, which can allow for more fine line and more nuance in your inked illustration. But regardless of what paper and what pens you choose, it's all about finding what works for you personally. Different artists like different things, so I heavily encourage you to get out there, make friends with other artists, and set up play dates where you bring a bunch of supplies and you all try out different things and teach each other new techniques. These inks all need to cure for at least 24 hours before I attempt erasing them. That's going to help prevent lifting and ghosting. Ghosting is when your eraser picks up some of the ink particles and makes your ink look grayer or muddier than it actually is. So I would allow the inks to bond and cure to the paper. And then I would use a white vinyl eraser similar to this one here and just gently erase my inks and then use a drafting brush to brush away the eraser dust before I scan it. So pretty simple. I hope you guys found today's inking crash course to be helpful, useful, and informative. If you have any more questions about inking, make sure you check the description. I will have several helpful playlists that deep dive into these individual materials a little bit more linked down in the description below. And if you still have questions, even after you've checked that out, Come hit me up on the paint box, my, again, art-centric Discord server, and I would be happy to try to troubleshoot your problems and answer your questions to the best of my ability. And if I can't, we've got a community of amazing artists who all have different interests, and they might be able to help you out. So I want to thank you guys so much for hanging out with me today. I really hope this was helpful, useful, and informative. I recorded this to help me prepare for Art Squad Advanced October Meetup, where we're going to be talking about inking. This allowed me to make some demos, and it allowed me to kind of collect my thoughts. So I would really appreciate you guys helping me do that. And I also really appreciate my amazing patrons on Patreon because their support over the years enables me to make these kind of tutorials it helps me afford these consumables and it helps me dedicate the time to do this so thank you guys so much if you like what I do and you want to help me continue to do it you can join me over on patreon at patreon.com slash natto soup and if you guys would like to check out more of my work or if you'd like to see these as mini tutorials make sure you check me out on tiktok at natto soup I hope you guys have a wonderful day. If you found this helpful, useful, and informative, remember to leave me a big ol' thumbs up. And if you're new here, hi, hello, welcome. Why don't you hit that subscribe button and the bell notification to let YouTube know that you'd like to hang out with me more often. I hope you guys have a wonderful day, and I hope this has inspired you to give inking a try. Bye, guys!